got another interesting Atherin project here, and that is an original GP9 unbuilt in its original box. Now I purchased this as a dummy unit, so you can see the original parts in their bags here, as well as the shell and its frame. But I wanted this to be a powered unit, so I also bought a working Globe F7 chassis separately from this and just disassembled and cleaned it up. And the only difference in those parts is that the shafts on the motor are a little bit shorter. Beyond that, all of that is identical to what you would get in a powered GP9 kit. So for this video, I'm going to be building this as a powered model, and we'll see how these original Atherns look and perform. The GP9 was first released in 1957 and was the first plastic model to be developed specifically to sell under the Athern name. Unlike the F7, which was first developed as a Globe product and became an Athern later on. So these started out pretty expensive when they were first released with a decorated model costing $16.95. That's about $185 in today's dollars as of early 2024. Or you can get a belt drive unit for $12.95, which was about $140, $145 now. Prices dropped pretty quickly though, especially as they started including them in train sets, and it was pretty common to find them for a price closer to $10 or $11.95 from most sellers and stores. Now, around the time, Lionel was also trying to get some HO products and had Ather do some manufacturing for them. So they got a couple GP9s decorated for the Wabash and Milwaukee Railroads, but they didn't offer those for long, so those ended up becoming Atherin products later on. Now in the mid-60s, the GP9 was revised from the original tower gear drive system to the chassis that Atherin still uses today for most of their four-axle diesels. They also made a little revision to the shell so that the horns, instead of fitting to the cab, would fit to the top of the short nose. And then in the early mid 1970s, after they released the FP45 and started adding flywheels to all their models, the GP9 also got flywheels. And by this time, they were selling the gear drive unit for $11.95, which, counting for inflation to that time, is only about $75. So their value thanks to Atherin's increased efficiency in manufacturing and other processes, had greatly, greatly lowered the price compared to the dollar value of the time. And then in 1984, it got the same upgrade as the rest of their four-axle diesels with the new plastic side frames that were much better detailed, as well as the new slimmer motor and brass flywheels. And this would be the version that they sold up until the end of production in the early 2000s. Now, of course, Atherin wouldn't forget their legacy. And after many years, they finally released a new GP9 with the correct width hood and modern detailing under the Genesis name. So to start off, I'll just take everything out of here. The uh, dummy unit parts, they had these uh, drum axles, which were... Also would have been used on the uh, rubber band drive. So some of these parts are kind of rusted and will have to be replaced, those wire railings. But the rest of it is still in its new condition. Yeah, there's another railing that is just completely rusted to pieces. Let's see, the motor and there's one coupling. There should be another coupling in there. And these here are parts that I... There are adapters that I 3D printed in order to get these uh, couplings to the length needed for the GP9. So let's just uh, move that box out of there. And this bag is all the power unit parts. So on these original ones, they actually had plastic side frames, unlike the metal ones that came on the later um, tower gear drive units with the plastic towers in the metal. These side frames here are the same ones that came on the dummy Globe F7 kits. So, shared tooling there. And of course, you've got the uh, brass wheels with the gears on them and these metal bearings that are pre-installed. Needlepoint bearings, they uh, 
support the uh, side frames, I believe. So all these parts were actually used before, but only very lightly. So it's all still in really good condition. The brushes have almost zero wear on them. I might as well get that put together so the motor's ready to go. Yeah, I just made those to press onto there. And then these universal cups press inside very firmly. There we go. So that'll get these to the correct position to work with the GP9. There, so that's ready to go whenever I need it. Now, there are the assembly instructions right here. I don't really need them to build it, of course, but you can at least see what the steps were for putting the dummy unit together. Anyway, yeah, here are the gears to go inside of there and the uh, tower gear drive boxes. So. The gears just have a really long shaft that goes into there and that keeps them straight and stable. And they spin really freely too. A lot better than the plastic tower drives that came a few years after these. Well, let's see. Cover plate goes there. They've just got a couple short screws to hold these together. That started. Actually, it looks like these use the medium length screws instead of those short ones. Okay, so there's the upper gearbox. And these gears are free to move around in there. And there's really no sort of bearing on these cover plates, but it feels like it still turns freely enough that it really shouldn't cause any issues. Although a little oil can still be added in there to make sure that there won't be a problem. It looks like there is just a little sort of cast in washer ring there. So that's likely what helps it to continue running smooth. Just add a little oil in there, make sure that's ready to go. That really is a long bearing that they've got. So these must've been pretty expensive to produce. So it makes, it makes sense why they would have cheapened things so much along the way. All turns nice and free. And now for the truck, let's see. So this here supports the worm shaft, which also has pre-installed bearings, and those are flattened on two sides from the look of it. So that must be what holds it straight. Let's see, I should use the uh, larger truck piece here. I wonder if those uh, flat sides line up somewhere. Well, I guess out there is just how they go in. Okay. Yeah, so actually, knowing that, I actually need to put the axles on there first. So for the front truck, I'll make that one the positive. Then the rear truck the negative. Same bearings that are flat on the sides. Now it's in there. Looks good, turns freely. Wheels are tarnished, so I'll have to clean them up before I actually try running this. All right, got the oil in there, so now let's do the same for the other axle. Being careful not to poke myself on those needle points. And that's ready to go. So now I'll drop that back into there. And 
Okay, so the flat sides on the worm shafts do have to go to either side so that they can properly rest down in there and mesh with the axle gears. Okay, that looks good. Turns super freely. This really is so much better than the plastic tower drive that came later. Now before I close that up, I should grease these gears. Easy way to do that, I'll just uh, put it on the top of these worms. Normally I like to put it into the gear teeth, but sometimes it works just fine to do it this way. The grease will work its way through either way. So turn that, spread that out a little, see how it does. Yeah, that's all looking good. All right, so now put the top plate or the cover plate on there. And let's see, these two screw holes need to be open for the tower, so it's these here that will hold the truck together. See, those screws are a little too long, so I guess it's a uh, medium length here too. There, so that's a nice compact sealed design and everything still turns super freely. The shaft even coasts just a tiny bit, so that's all really good. So then the gear tower fits on top of there and is held in place by two long screws. Just have to make sure those tabs are aligned. There, so that's a really tight assembly. Now before I screw that down, of course, I need to add more grease, so I'll just go ahead and do that. Now if these tower gears were the same size top and bottom, you would want to add the grease all the way around, but since these are not the same size, you can add it just on top there, and it'll work its way through very quickly. All right, so now yeah, should be these longer screws this time. All right, so that's how that goes in there. Now the top gear tower is actually part of what holds the truck in there, so I'm gonna take that back off to install it to the frame. I just wanted to do this so that I could run the grease through a little make sure everything is turning freely. And that all feels really good. So speaking of the frame, let's go ahead and take that out of the shell. It's tight on there. I'm probably going to paint this frame at some time later just to match the shell, but for now I'm just going to leave it in the bare metal as Atherin likely would have done on their ready to, well, as they pretty much always did on their ready to run versions back then. Yeah, the grease spread through that gear real nicely, so that's a good sign. Now there's also a bushing to support this. That goes right there. Truck rests in place, action, yeah. Yeah, that bushing goes there because both trucks have to be insulated from the frame in order for this to work. Yeah, just with the way that this is supposed to go together, these should fit through the bottom. Now, it is really stiff, so let's see, I need to tap that in. There it goes. There's so now that's fit flush in place. It's a little bit of a tight fit, but it still pivots. 
And yeah, just uh, work that around there. That's freeing things up a little bit. So yeah, that feels good now. Yeah, so far, this is feeling like a really solid design. So just screw that in. Oh, you know what? One thing I just noticed, the uh, side frame supports are floating, which means I need to take that top cover plate back off from the truck. There, so these fit in there. Oh, they fit underneath, I see, I see. There, so that's where the side frame supports fit. So now these side frames should just press into place. If they're loose, I can glue them, but yeah, it's feeling like a proper press fit there. There we go, so those slightly float on those needle point bearings. It's mostly supported by the uh, um, middle piece in, in there, but yeah, there's some support from the needle point bearings. There, now I'll put this back in here. There, and there's one truck in place. So far, so good. All right, there's the basic work on the chassis done. Two trucks are assembled in there. So now I just need to put in the motor and universals. So I'll just uh, start this way, just one at a time. That in there. Get that lined up in there. Maybe it'll be easier to go the other way. I'm guessing the correct method would have been to put the motor in first and then do the gear towers, but this still works. Okay, and it looks like my spacers have the correct alignment, so that's good. So now I've just got these two screws to hold the motor in. Just have to get that lined up. There. And aside from having to add a wire going to each of the trucks, that is the completed chassis. So let's see. Actually, I think I can press this end on a little further. So it's not quite fitting. There, that looks better. That should run nice and smooth. Just to make sure though, let's hook that up and see how it does. It's running nice and smooth. Might still need a little bit more there. Yeah, this is all looking really good so far. Motor doesn't have a lot of torque. I might put that through my reed magnetizer, see if that does anything to help. I don't really feel much magnetism in there. And if you pull this motor apart, which I actually did that when I was cleaning this up at first, just to make sure everything was in good shape, this is actually basically the same armature that you get in the later motors with the black magnetic ring around them, the Jet 400 motors. So they basically just took their same armature and put a new motor housing around it and then 
kept that design until their gold motors, which still had a really similar armature. They just skewed it and changed the windings. Let's see. This way. I wonder if this will work. So the way that they magnetize this one is they have two very small bars on the top, very small bar magnets on the top and bottom of the motor. And then they create the field by putting two steel plates inside of there. That's barely holding in place at all. Feels a little bit of magnetic cogging in there. Let's see what that did. Current draw seems to be lower. Still not a lot of torque. It feels like it's running pretty well overall. Well, let's put this back in and see if that made a difference. That does feel stronger. So the remagnetizer did work on there. And it's good to know. It might be possible to replace those original magnets with some neodymium ones, but they would have to be a very exact size and polarization to work right. So it could be more difficult than putting a new magnet in a Pittman motor. But anyway, since that's done, now I just need to get those wires. I thought I kept those with this, but I must have separated them by accident. All right. Now I just need a couple of those little screw-in spades. Here, I've got some from Atlas. These are really nice. Those will work fine. Connect these right here to each of the trucks. See, that shouldn't cause any interference in the shell, I don't think. Nope, that's fine. Let's tin that with a little bit of solder. Wire goes there. Oh, actually, that's right. Made the front truck, the positive truck, and the rear truck negative. So in that case, I will solder it right here. Oh, after I take this old piece of wire off. So I reverse the col colors. Normally I do red for, red for positive, black for negative. But I know which way it goes, so it's no matter to me. Just as long as it works. Which I know it will. Okay. So let's wire it up. On these first atherns, it was only four wheel electrical pickup. You got two wheels from each truck. Like I mentioned before, those wheels are pretty well tarnished, so this first track test might not even work. But no harm in trying. Alright, it works fine. 
fact, that runs pretty well. That's pretty quiet too. All right, so I'll just uh, clean up those wheels and we'll give it its first full layout track test. All right, fully assembled and tuned up chassis. All ready for its first test on the layout. Takes right off. It's got some gear noise. It's not bad though. The lighting is definitely less than I would have expected. That's a really good tower gear system compared to quite a few others that I've seen. Oh bolts. So it moves along pretty fast. That's to be expected though. Since the top tower gear is larger than the bottom, that um, speeds up the gearing. I haven't counted the teeth, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's about a 9 or 10 to 1 ratio in here. And combined with this older motor, that'll give it a pretty high top speed. But the control of the chassis is really good. Starts up nice and smooth. Low speed control is good too. With more run time, I wouldn't be surprised if that gets even better. So oh, there you go, Atherin's first eight-wheel drive chassis design. That is not bad at all. I was kind of second-guessing myself about that insulator, so I went to HO Seeker since they've got the original manual on their website, and I found I did put that in upside down, so I flipped both of these around. Now I've got the uh, insulating washer on top of the truck, which is something I hadn't put in there before. I just need to slip that back together and continue on with the assembly. And that should all fit together real nice. Well, with the chassis done, I think we can get onto the details now. So one of those bags has the detail parts in it. The other two original bags from the dummy kit just had the uh, disassembled trucks and other chassis mounting parts for the trucks. So there are all the details. Let's see, these are just the air tanks that go into the chassis there. I think I'll have to open these holes up a little, maybe. Nope. Only a tiny bit of flash in there, so a firm press through. And the air tanks fit right in. And that's just a nice press fit, so no need for glue. And for the other parts, we've got couplers, some old style horn hooks with coil springs for the return. I might install those, but I might also put in, well, I'll install these, but then put in Katie's later. For now though, I'm just building it basically as it would have been. So the front railings, the end railings. So that means it's just the two long um, side handrails that need to be replaced. And for that, I have this uh, .032 music wire from K&S. So that'll be a close enough match to the original Atherin wire. And will look just fine on there. See, these appear to be the couple mounting boxes or blocks, as well as the screws for them. Ah, and these are the horns. I see. So instead of the uh, ho horns that go through two holes in the side, they just press into these really tiny holes in the end of the cab. Let's see if that's actually a press fit, though. Yeah, I think these can use a touch of glue. So just 
tiniest drop of super glue. Line that up with the hole. And press that in. Super glue will hold that real nicely. Same for the other one. There, those are fit tightly in place. And you've got these uh, side pieces for the uh, dynamic brake. I think these just press fit on there. Yeah, looks that way. Yeah, they still feel a tiny bit loose, so for these, I might use plastic glue. Well, super glue will do fine here. We'll just use it on the tab. No need to mess up the outer shell with liquid glue that could flow out through the seams. That'll hold tightly in place. Just let that set a little bit. Okay, those are glued on. Just holding that a little more to make sure. They're not quite a perfect fit, but I'd say that's good enough. Okay. Uh, let's see. This part, ah, this goes right here. Not quite pressing in though. Yeah, for this one, maybe I'll use a little bit of the liquid glue. That'll help to soften that tab and make it press into the hole a little easier. There we go. Yeah, the liquid glue, glue softened that up, so it pressed into the hole, and now that will set into place. And this other one will probably need it too. Okay, that looks good. So next up for the shell is the handrails. But first, I'm going to put these couplers on so that I can just put the shell onto the chassis. And to do that, all right, so it looks like these springs will just uh, fit onto these pins. Hopefully. Let's see if I can get that up on a razor and then. Okay, so that there is how the coupler spring fits into place on these old ones. And then place the box down over it. Screw that down. And you've got a working coupler. It actually feels a lot nicer than the usual ones that have that plastic spring built in that kind of loops around. And now let's get the other one in there. A little bit of flash on here. Let's just break that off. 
Sometimes you don't need to use a file or sandpaper for simple edges like that. Just break it off with pliers and continue on. Now these early kits did not include window glass or headlight lenses, so there's nothing to put in there in this case. So I'll just go ahead and snap the shell on now. And that's looking pretty good. Now for the handrails, these oldest ones are simple to do because instead of the uh, um, folded over metal like they did for all their later stanchions, they just squeezed the ends and drilled through them. So that makes them really easy to thread onto the railing. This should just go into the holes in the cab and shell. But that's another really tight fit, so let's get the pliers here, see if that helps. There we go. It takes a little twisting and a nice firm push, but it does go through. Let's get that last one lined up. And let's see. Press that in, straighten that out, and there's the first railing done. That looks good. And also, since that one original railing was, you know, at least when you line up both of the pieces, it's the correct length, so I've been working with that music wire to create replacement railings, and this should be the perfect size to go on there, so let's test that out and see how it turned out. So I'll start with the cab there. That went in. Need eight stanchions on there. That, so now just uh, put those hang down, press that into the hole in the steps, okay. Now if I did this right, everything will fit just as if this was an original railing. All right, I was close. It's not quite perfect, so I had to shorten that stanchion just a little bit to make things at least set straight. So there's a little curve up there. Beyond that, I think that turned out looking really good, so I'll just uh, go around and put the rest of the railings on. All right, I'd say that railing turned out looking good. Everything's nice and straight and fitting properly, and the rest of the railings I've got on there too, and they all look good. There's just a tiny bit of rust here and there on some of them. And I'll probably add a little drop of super glue to each of these later, just so they can't drift around like this. But other than that, the assembly of the GP9 is finished and this is ready to run. So there it is on the layout, looking pretty good, I'd say. Now getting on to the review, I'd say that this is overall a good looking engine from Athern and an overall good representation of the GP7 and GP9. Of course this was labeled as a GP9 but it is actually closer to a GP7 from what I've read. Just some of the details here and there. But it, then it was mislabeled as a GP9 and they did later on change that to GP7 to be more accurate. So with this being the first plastic engine developed under the Athern name, that's uh, not including the F7 from a couple years before because that was developed under the Globe name, I'd say that they did a good job with the detailing on here, even if by today's standards it's pretty crude. 
Um, some of the details, of course, they're a little oversized, undersized, just not very finely molded in certain places, but other places you do get some pretty fine looking details that are molded in, like the ventilation. I think that all looks really good. Grab irons, of course, are molded directly onto the shell, and those look about as basic as molded on grab irons can get, so they are definitely not the best detail on here, but at least they're there on some other models, like uh, some of the Ataika ones I've seen. They would leave off grab irons in certain locations just to make room for decals and lettering, which was kind of an interesting detail choice on that part. Now, as I mentioned during the assembly, these handrails are only wire and they're about 0.032 inches thick, which is about um, two scale inches in HO or just a little over two inches. So they're definitely oversized. This is one of the details that would be the first to get improved by Athern as they switch to their sheet metal stanchions that bend over the railing. And then over time, they would come out with finer stanchions and use thinner wire for the rails. So the scaling would be just that little bit better later on. Now, as I mentioned during the assembly, the headlight lenses and window glass were all missing from these first models. But I think it was only about a few years before they started adding that. So only these earliest ones came without those parts. And when they added those in, it really did help things to look that much better. Of course, these details are easy to add in, just using some uh, clear plastic window material, and then you can use uh, lenses in the front or even just find some Atherin lenses from later on to press into place. Now the trucks, of course, are one of the things that look really um, crude and low detail compared to modern standards. And the metal side frames that Atherin would make after these, they would look pretty much the same maybe just a little bit better, but mostly the same. And then in the early, mid-1980s, they would develop their much better detailed plastic side frames, which you can see here on my Atherin F7. And that was another major improvement to the GP7, as well as other Atherin diesels that use the same trucks. The paint quality is about what I would expect for a model of this era. Kind of fuzzy around the edges, looks all right. Not bad overall, but they also made some little mistakes with masking. You can see the silver paint made it down onto the walkway behind the um, rear hood there. And then moving over to the lettering, their printing wasn't that good yet, so the Southern Pacific logo is pretty messy. The letters aren't all that well aligned and they have some very rounded edges instead of the nice sharp printing that they would manage to do not too long after this. And that's another thing that would, of course, improve along the way. 5600 logo, probably the worst part of the whole model. Those letters aren't at all well lined up. And then the uh, Black Widow striping up here. That's done pretty well overall. The uh, lines are a little bit sharper but you can still see some fuzz around the edges. And if nothing else, the paint is nice and opaque. You don't see any transparency anywhere. One interesting detail addition that they have on here is the winterization hatch. Um, I don't know if more GP9s and GP7s had that installed than the ones that didn't, but I think it would have been better if they just went with the regular vent right there. So then Super detail parts manufacturers could make winterization hatches for the modelers to add later. And as for the vents themselves, they look about um, as good as any other from the time. They're not the best, but they are at least there and the molding is sharp enough to look decent. And the fuel tank is about as basic and generic as you can get, but they did at least add those air tank details to press into there. so. That makes it look quite a bit better than what it could have been otherwise. And a quick shot of paint to the chassis will have things blending together pretty well and looking good overall. Also, one more thing I want to note about the paint is that the cab was painted separately from the rest of the shell. And I don't really know what happened there, if they just used a different grade of paint or what, but 
it doesn't look the same as the rest of the shell. This is original paint, it just didn't turn out with that nice smooth black that's on the rest of the shell here. Now at the time that Atherin released this, there was only one other manufacturer making an HO scale GP7 or GP9, and that was Tin Shoto, who had them imported through Pacific Fast Mail. And these do have a scale width hood, unlike the Atherin hood, which is um, very obviously too wide. They did that to make room for the motor as well as those wide tower geared trucks. So the brass model here is at least better scaled in that regard, but for the overall detail, I think Atherin actually did quite a bit better. Their details are sharper, more realistic, and some of the things around the uh, Tin Shoto model are I mean, very obviously just kind of uh, made to be put together quickly by hand, like the screens there. I do like that those are actual screens that are soldered in place, but the detail around them is about as flat and generic as you can possibly get. So when Atherin brought out their GP7, GP9, I think that took away most of the business that PFM was getting for these imported ones. And the last time I saw the last catalog appearance I could find for these was 1959. Now the weight of the model is decent at right around 13 ounces. So it's less than a pound, less than the weight of some of the other models that you would get today, or even some of the ones from back then that were made of metal, like that uh, Tin Shoto one. So the traction of this one isn't going to be quite as much as some of the other models of the same era, but at the same time, that still gives it more than enough traction with its eight-wheel drive to pull a very realistic load of freight cars. Now getting on to the running quality. I think you all saw before that while I was building the chassis, this was a pretty smooth runner. And now it's had about an hour and a half to run in, so things are pretty well seated and where they should be. Working as well as they can. It takes off nice and smoothly for someone that has only four-wheel pickup and no flywheels. And it runs along really nice and smooth too. There's really no perceptible wobble that I can see, or at least very little of it. It's got some very good quality wheels. The gearing also works nice and smooth. Makes a little bit of noise, of course, with it being a tower gearing system, but it's definitely lacking the usual whine that you would get with most of those uh, um, spur gear um, tower transfer systems. So this is, again, a really well engineered chassis. Everything is super free running, so even with the uh, motor being a little weaker than the ones they made later, it really has no problem at all driving this model. Runs well in both directions. And the top speed is definitely really fast. I measured that to be, when everything is warmed up, I measured that to be about 155 scale miles per hour. So it's a combination of the high speed motor as well as the slightly faster gearing that this has over the later, more common after blue box drives. And again, when you're in the range up to about 8 volts, the speed range is pretty realistic. As for the low speed, it's not the best in that area. Again, a little bit lower torque of the motor and faster gearing kind of prevents it from being as good as it could be. So the best I've been able to get as far as a steady speed is about um, seven, maybe eight scale miles per hour. I've been able to get it to run down to about three, but it's not very reliable at that point. It tends to stop and go. So um, yeah, the seven to eight mile per hour range is about as well as this can run steadily. It's not bad though. And these are going to be running, um, pulling the freight trains most of the time, more than the uh, yard switching duty, I would say, unless you've got a more modern railroad, which at this point, these would have been relegated to that kind of service. As for the amperage, I'm really impressed with how efficient this is, actually. 
when it's uh, coming from a cold start, running free, it's about 0.4 amps at 12 volts and at a more realistic speed when everything is warmed up. I've even seen the current draw get down to about a quarter of an amp, so that's about half as much as I usually see from the typical blue box chassis. So just uh, again, really good engineering in here. Everything turns very freely, very smoothly. And they really didn't get that kind of efficiency again for probably about the um, uh, 20, 25 years before they developed the gold motor and made some improvements to the construction of the trucks for tighter fit and better alignment. Because the uh, earlier trucks that, the, that had the uh, modern gearing that we all know in them, their construction was a little bit sloppy overall and that could cause resistance in the mechanism. And then for stall current, since this does use the same armature as the um, black ring magnet Jet 400 motors, it's uh, 2 amps, so it needs a pretty hefty decoder if you're going to be installing DCC in this. But running free, it's really an efficient runner. Now to test the pulling power, I've been loading up cars behind it. And I've got that up to 25 average size free rolling freight cars now. And even with that much, it really has no problem at all pulling them along. Starts up a little slower. You can hear a little more of the gear whine and growl since there's now some stress on them from having to pull that load. Still not too noisy though. It sounds like an apple, really. And of course, the extra strain of the freight cars does add to the current draw and reduce the top speed a little bit. So, right now it's using about a half amp on average to pull this load. And that's actually still a little better than what I was expecting, so it's really doing very well for everything that I've put it through so far. And since that motor is all metal and it's screwed down directly to the chassis, the chassis can act as a heat sink to help spread out the heat of the motor and actually help it to run for longer periods of time without damage. So this is overall an engine with a really nicely designed and durable chassis. I would have no doubt that this will run for an extremely long time for many years of service without any issues. So after going through the process of building this and testing it out, it's very easy to see how this model helps to make Atherin one of the premier manufacturers of their day. The plastic shell, even if it's crude by today's standards, is quite a bit better than most of the other plastic shells developed in the 1950s for HO scale. Now, of course, other models that came out in the 1960s quickly caught up to this and even exceeded it. But for where it lacks in detail, it easily makes up for that in its running quality with a very well-engineered chassis that's smooth running, powerful, and reliable. And even the rubber band drive chassis, which I've also tested before for the GP9, was a good and reliable runner as long as you kept the um, rubber bands well maintained and everything else well maintained. So all those options that Atherin offered for the starter or even the uh, more serious uh, modeler of the day really made this a great option for anyone who was buying it. So. I can very easily imagine that the people who were buying this in the 1950s and through the 60s were very happy with what they were getting. So if you come across one of these for a decent price, I would say go ahead and get it because I really think you're going to be happy with what you get. It's a great model and a good piece of model railroading history.